said last night at the reception, I am, um, it's such a privilege to be here and I'm really appreciative to Vivek and Wendy and the conference organizers for inviting me and I'm just thrilled to be able to spend the week with all of you and I'm really looking forward to hearing about your projects and to having lots of stimulating and productive conversations this week. So you'll recognize the template. We were all asked to use the same format and to go through a series of different um, sections and questions to pose to you from, and my charge is to talk about changing behavior. Um, I want to just acknowledge, of course, I have to acknowledge NIH. Um, some of the work I'll be talking about here is reflected in some of these awards from NIH. Um, before I, I talk a bit about using technology for behavior change, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our center because it's really influenced my perspective and the data that we've been able to collect over the past 15 or so years in this space has really influenced how I think about the application of technology to behavior change. So um, we've had the privilege of receiving a center <laughs> grant award from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and our center is called the Center for Technology and Behavioral Health. And it's uh, housed at Dartmouth College, but we have partners and collaborators all over the country and a growing array of international partners. And here's the, well, here's the URL for the website, but here's really the charge of the center. It's really around enhancing quality, pace of achievement, and impact of scientific work in this space. And particularly, we use science to focus on development, optimal models of development of technology-based therapeutic tools, as well as systematic evaluation using lots of different uh, research designs and methodologies, and then also uh, we have a whole core of the center focused on using science to inform strategic and sustainable implementation and refinement of models over time to really transform healthcare service delivery. We were asked to talk a little bit about guiding principles in this space, and this is a framework that's been very helpful to the faculty and the partners in our Center for Technology and Behavioral Health, and some of you may be familiar with this. It's called the stage model of behavioral and integrative treatment development. And it's really a recursive model. So it's not that you start at stage zero and move towards stage five, but all the stages really inform one another in a recursive way. So in our center, we have the opportunity to focus not only on basic research, which is called stage zero, but lots of early stage work around how do you best develop tools that are feasible and acceptable and comprehensible to lots of different target audiences and doing pilot work in this space. And then um, we have work focused on clinical efficacy trials, which are really tightly controlled, rigorous designed designs where you have um, lots of research staff sort of implementing all aspects of the interventions. And this is really um, focusing on high internal validity. Clinical efficacy trials in community settings uh, are similar, except that usually you have community-based um, staff helping to implement uh, an intervention. And so there is more of, although there's still really fairly tight experimental control, there's a lot more generalizability in the results. And then moving into effectiveness trials, stage four, we do a lot of multi-site national clinical effectiveness trials and look also at cost effectiveness of different types of technology systems and different systems of care. Um, and these are really real world effectiveness trials. Often sometimes we do pragmatic trials where we're truly working with community-based systems in the implementation of trials. And then finally, in stage five, this is really heavily about implementation research. What's going to promote adoption and sustained use of empirically supported technologies in a way that recognizes the perspectives of all the, perspectives of all the relevant stakeholders, right? So it's not just patient outcomes, but it's the clinicians, the administrators, the payers, the regulatory systems in which these systems of care exist. So I encourage you to look into this model. This was originally written up um, and has been refined over the years by uh, some folks at NIH, Lisa Ankin and her team originally at the National Institute on Drug Abuse and she's now at the National Institute on Aging. So in this space, um, we've had the chance to work with an interdisciplinary team which is composed not only of behavioral um, scientists who specialize in behavioral health, but also health behavior and health behavior change, emerging technologies and ubiquitous computing and data analytics, health economics um, and implementation science. And the work we've been able to do collectively has focused on all kinds of populations from people with chronic substance use to people with mental health problems to people with severe mental illnesses like psychotic illnesses such as schizophrenia um, to people living with chronic pain to veterans to children and adolescents to Native American communities um, to people living with HIV to people living with chronic medical illnesses. And a lot of this work has been done in a lot of different contexts. So it includes specialty addiction and mental health treatment settings, but also includes 
primary care and hospitals and emergency departments and medical specialty programs and direct to consumer online, criminal justice settings, um, as well as schools and colleges. So I tell you this because what's really helpful in this space is that we've had the opportunity, I've had the privilege really, of looking at this whole landscape of research, of looking at this, how do you apply technology-based behavior change interventions across all kinds of populations in all kinds of contexts. And what's really striking from this literature is that there are some very core fundamental aspects of behavior change. So there's really, a, truly a science of behavior change and some key principles that are fundamental to behavior change across all these populations and all these contexts. And that's not to say that you don't need to consider your population and your context in the development of these tools. But there's some fundamental aspects that I really want to highlight to you because I think we often get trained in very siloed models. You know, someone's trained in substance use or someone's trained in depression or someone's trained in helping people with medication adherence, for example. And um, what's really striking is that there's a lot of overlap in the principles of behavior change that transcend disorder, that transcend population. And so here are some of the guiding principles in the work that we do, which is really based on this data, really, it's really based on, you know, volumes of data from uh, this sort of array of research activities I've briefly mentioned. And um, really focus on increasing not only the personal resources to an individual, social resources to an individual that support and reinforce healthy goal-directed behavior and reduce self-defeating behaviors cross population. So one is something called behavioral activation, which is you know, activating behavior change. How do you do that based on an individual's preferences and values? There are some fundamental tools that have been shown to be helpful in this regard. How do you effectively solve problems? There's this whole approach called problem-solving therapy, which really applies, again, to a whole host of populations. How do you solve problems? How do you overcome obstacles to effective behavior change? How do you teach skills? How do you learn new skills? and um, develop sort of a new behavioral repertoire based on those skills that can provide guidance in the execution of behavior change. And then, of course, there's motivation. How do, you, how do you help people get and stay motivated to maintain the change? And then there are principles of reinforcement, right? So how do you facilitate users' communication with a social support network, as one example, leveraging social media or other approaches to, in, to reinforce um, initiation and maintenance of health behavior change? And I'd be happy to talk about a lot of these principles in much more detail as we, as we talk during this week. But I just wanted to highlight to you that it's really striking that these are very active ingredients of lots of behavior change interventions across lots of populations. OK, so we were asked to talk about some key terms and define them. So I have historically worked heavily in the space of behavioral health. So what is behavioral health? Well, it's got a much longer, sort of more fancy definition. But really, you can think about it as things like mental health, things like depression, anxiety, um, psychotic illnesses, mental health, as well as substance use. Okay, so that's behavioral health, which is a very different term than health behavior, right? So health behavior includes a much broader spectrum of preventative health, of uh, medical regimen adherence, of chronic disease management. And I want to highlight that although we've um, had, we're funded by NIDA, we've had the opportunity to work heavily in the space of substance use and mental health, which are hugely important issues, right? We know that one in four to one in five adults in this country have one or more mental health disorders. We know that about one in 10 adults in this country have a substance use disorder. And these are very, very um, difficult disorders, very challenging disorders, right? They, they really can have a huge impact on people's lives and functioning, not only on their health status for people with addictions, for example, but also their ability to um, maintain jobs, to be parents, to have healthy relationships, to have good quality of life. I mean, the, the you know, higher rates of mortality, morbidity, et cetera. So these are striking phenomena in their own regard. But what we also know is that when behavioral health problems coexist with other types of health problems, like physical health conditions, when those things cluster together, we know that the clinical outcomes are much worse and the cost of care are much higher. Right? So when depression and diabetes co-occur, we know it's much tougher to manage diabetes than if diabetes is occurring alone. Okay? And we know the cost of care are, you know, are sometimes 50 to 75% higher when these things cluster together than when they don't. So I mention this because, again, back to this issue of sort of siloed work, right? although behavioral health is hugely important and there's lots of terrific work being done in the space of M-health and, and mental health and behavioral health more broadly, 
behavioral health intersects with the full spectrum of health and wellness. And I think it's really important for us to think about these things in an integrated way and how behavioral health impacts preventative health and chronic disease management, and not only looking at how that impacts clinical outcomes, but also um, cost outcomes. Another term that I'll mention briefly is mechanisms. You've heard that term a little bit here. I think this is a really key area of scientific research, really understanding what are the fundamental mechanisms of behavior change. What are the mechanisms by which these tools work? Not do they work, but how do they work? And this is really defined here as intervention-induced changes in psychological, behavioral, and or biological factors. There are lots of different levels of analysis of mechanisms of behavior change, which in turn are responsible for health behavior change. So there are some really terrific models for um, uh, evaluating mechanisms of behavior change, but I think it's very fundamental for us to understand mechanisms of behavior change in order to get replicability in uh, intervention effects, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. So the state of the science, this is a high-level slide without a single graph on it that shows about 15 years of research in the space of mHealth as applied to um, behavioral health. And what we know is that if these tools are developed well, development is really key, um, development process can hugely impact whether or not a tool is used and whether or not it works, and we can talk at length about that. But if the tools are developed well, if they're developed in collaboration with your target audience, this is the profile of results you can see in the space of uh, behavior change. You can get highly useful and acceptable uh, technology-delivered interventions, mobile interventions, to lots of diverse populations. Um, you can have a big impact on health behavior and health outcomes across a whole array of metrics. You can get um, outcomes that are often comparable to, to or even better than what you get from clinicians delivering comparable care. And this is striking, and sometimes clinicians feel threatened by this, but we know that it's really key to be able to demonstrate that these things can really have um, can exert an effect, and we know, particularly in the behavioral health space, that there aren't enough mental health and substance use clinicians to meet need. And so it's really terrific to think about a new way, a new platform, a new model of service delivery that leverages technology to help meet that unmet need. Particularly, as we heard earlier, when Vivek was talking about changes in healthcare in this country and changing healthcare legislation, there's a very strong focus on integrated care, integrating behavioral health into primary care, integrating behavioral health into lots of general medical settings. And in that context, we don't have enough specialists that know anything about behavioral health. How do you screen for it? What do you do if you identify a problem? And so there's a real opportunity to offload some of that to technology platforms to facilitate integration. We also know that these tools can increase quality, reach, and personalization of care. We've got a growing array of data from our health economist partners, underscoring cost effectiveness of this approach in lots of different healthcare service delivery systems. And what's also really exciting is that these don't have to be static tools, as you all know, right? They can be, they can be responsive to people's changing needs and preferences. They're changing healthcare trajectories over time. So in terms of key questions, I've organized this into the three big sort of categories. First are opportunities in development of technology, second opportunities in evaluation, and third is opportunities in implementation. So first let's talk about opportunities in technology development. Um, just I'll go quickly through these, this is just to sort of stimulate some thought and discussion as you think about your own projects. But first I think it's really key when you think about what you're going to do that the clinical considerations, the clinical goals drive what you do with technology. I think it's really easy to get excited by every gadget of the moment and every sort of emerging device that's, you know, that are, that are developed on an ongoing basis. But I think that if we really have science and clinical considerations drive what we want to do with these tools, the outcomes can be much better than when we let the technology drive what we do. And I can talk more about that if you like. I'm just going to go through these quickly. The second one is um, challenges and, and opportunities, really, in breaking down siloed models of care. So um, we have all kinds of siloed tools. We have an app for depression. We have an app for managing your activity levels. We have an app for managing your sleep. We have a different app to manage your medication adherence, right? These things are so siloed and they, in some, you know, in some part they reflect how funding works, in some part they reflect how people have been trained, but we don't have to Technology doesn't require us to get locked into these rigid siloed models, right? There's a real opportunity to think about the array of needs and preferences of an end user and how can you be responsive to that and what you offer up to that person using technology. And I can talk more about that. We've been heavily working in that space. 
Another piece is engaging consumers as the main driver of development. This is huge. Um, you know, if we have a bunch of scientists or computer scientists or behavioral health scientists sitting around a table and deciding what to do with a creation of an app, you know, the, the engagement that you're going to get with that and the outcomes you're going to get with that are very different than if you have your end user informing the design from step one. And this might seem very simplistic to many of you, but it hugely impacts outcomes. Right, because you want a tool that's relevant to the experience of your end user, something that brings value to them and something that's going to drive engagement. So when we develop multimedia prevention games for third graders, we literally have third graders on our development team. When we developed you know, um, injection uh, drug use, HIV prevention tools um, for injection drug users, we have that population on our development team and it makes a huge difference. We talked a little bit about mechanisms of behavior change. I think that's a really key consideration is really understanding when we think about outcome measures, really understanding the mechanisms by which they work. So if we change drug use, okay, how do we do that? Okay, opportunities and evaluation, I'm gonna do this quickly. The first one you're gonna hear a lot about, we're really fortunate to have Susan Murphy here, but there's so much opportunity with novel research designs in this space that transcend our very terrific, but also um, slow um, RCT kind of model, randomized controlled trial model. I think there's an opportunity to think about um, new service delivery models and also accompanying payment models concurrently if we really want to transform healthcare systems to get the perspective of all the stakeholders. An interdisciplinary team is key. I mean, this is why it's so terrific we have such a diverse group here. This next point I'd, I'd like you to think about for a minute, which is understanding trajectories of consumer engagement, okay? Which is, you know, I think sometimes we, people develop tools and they think someone should use it, you know, three times a week for 12 weeks in order to make, sort of change some behavior. And if they don't do that, they're considered non-adherent. I think we don't know what, what is an optimal sort of level of engagement with these tools. It could be that if we're really giving someone a tool that's focused on changing, developing new skills and helping people change their behavioral repertoire, it might be that they start to internalize that and that strategic episodic use of these tools might be most meaningful thereafter. So I think we really need to understand trajectories of use. And then in terms briefly of deployment, I think that um, there's opportunities to think about new models of deployment. Maybe for some people are talking about prescription models where you have sort of a clinician extender model where you can prescribe or refer people to access these tools. Um, there's some opportunities, I think, with thinking about centralized te uh, technology support banks that can support an array of healthcare systems in adoption and using these tools. Lots of direct-to-consumer models. Um, and lots of opportunities for new partnerships, including in the global health space, we're um, growing our partnerships with a uh, number of low and middle income countries where, as many of you likely know, they have sometimes no landline infrastructure but often have um, mobile devices and terrific opportunities to harness that in the healthcare space. Okay, so um, these same questions you saw before in Donna's presentations, who would utilize folks that work in this space? I think there's a whole array of folks ranging from people doing, again, basic science work to people applying this in ch transforming healthcare systems. And why is this? Well, we know that behavior, um, the need to alter health-related behavior is ubiquitous across medicine. No matter what you're targeting, behavior is a fundamental aspect of it. So to understand the principles of behavior change, the mechanisms by which they work, are they similar, are they different across different populations and context? And this is important for understanding why intervention effects are and are not replicable. And I think it's really key when we're thinking about changing healthcare landscape where we're valuing quality, value, cost, and patient-centered care. Okay, so... Um, Wendy's telling me I have a few more minutes here. So I'm just going to very briefly mention one example. We were asked to talk about a case study. This is an example of a system where we've, it's a digital therapy basically for substance use disorders that we've studied extensively. I'm not going to talk about it in much detail, but we've had the, we and others have had the chance to study this for about 15 years. And it's an interactive behavior therapy basically for substance use disorders that's based on these principles of behavior change I mentioned. And I show you this because chronic drug use is a really difficult thing to change. And I want to show you an example of how you can use technology to change even some of the most um, difficult to change behaviors. What we find it, with this tool is that when you replace some clinician-delivered behavior therapy with this interactive behavioral intervention, it's a mobile-based intervention, 
It's as effective as what you get from highly trained clinicians delivering care, but it's much more effective than what you get in our traditional addiction treatment systems in this country, which typically do not include delivery of evidence-based behavioral care, behavioral treatments. So we reliably see you can as much as double abstinence rates from substances of abuse when you offer this system as part of the care model than when you do not. And that's a really striking finding. Um, so um, I'm just going to, for the sake of time, we have lots of examples of this, but I'm going to just show you two because of the time. One is that these are folks that, come, that are coming into outpatient addiction treatment where they either in the blue got treatment as usual, the standard model of care in community-based treatment in this country, or in the red, half of their clinician-patient contact time was replaced with this use of this interactive tool. So they still had a therapist, but they saw them 50%, they saw them uh, half the time than they did if they were in treatment as usual. What we find is that when you replace traditional counselor contact time with this interactive personalized digital therapy based on the principles of behavior change, you get much better outcomes. This is objective measurements of um, substance use based on urinalysis testing. We, hire, we see higher percent of abstinence when you offload some of the care delivery to this technology system versus when it's not part of the care model. We also um, saw that we can get better treatment retention. So what we found is that when people are offered this mobile intervention, this is a different trial now, as part of the intervention, um, we got 84% we got of them to stay in treatment when they enter treatment versus 56% when they did not. This is really striking because treatment retention is a very strong predictor of long-term outcomes from addiction treatment. So if you can get people to stay longer, then this actually is a very good sign. So this is, this is a very striking phenomenon that when you offer a simple tool that's based on you know, sort of you know, these, these principles we've been talking about, what an impact it can have on retention as well as on um, substance use. Again, this is another example from that trial of how you act, this actually translates into substance taking behavior. Okay, and then we have a whole array of uh, implementation trials that we're involved in. I mentioned this for folks who may be interested as we talked this week um, in implementing technology behavioral health systems into primary care across multiple sites in the US as well as in some international projects we're doing. Um, we um, have also I, a couple other things. We were asked to mention things that might be of interest to this group as you work this week. A couple other things of interest. We have just received um, funding to launch a new node, it's called, of a national clinical trials network for the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which is the opportunity to run multi-site trials around the country. And the big focus is on using technology to facilitate integration of behavioral health into primary care. So lots of your expertise would be relevant to these national initiatives. Um, and the other final thing I'll say is that we've been, I'm really excited about, uh, we've been working quite a lot on creating a sort of a web ecosystem, a mobile ecosystem that's useful to any end user, right? So it's any end user, no matter what your disorder, what, what your issue, what your goals and preferences are, there's a common entry into the system and then your experience in the system varies depending on your goals, your values, your preferences, uh, Etc. So this is something that I'd love to talk to you about because I think a lot of your expertise would be very relevant to thinking about deployment of this in different contexts. And it can include um, sensing data as well as um, all kinds of opportunity to leverage new technologies. I have to shamelessly plug our book. Well, and also um, because I, it, for those of you who have any interest in the space of behavioral health and technology, this is, we were really fortunate to get a terrific group of authors to contribute to this. It's an edited volume and may be of interest to some of you. So I'll stop there. This is my contact information, and I'm looking forward to this week. Thank you.